E3 has come to a close, but there's been a ton of news coming out of the event. Developers have been dropping some tasty morsels about pretty much everything. So here are some cherry-picked news nuggets that came out of E3 2018. First up, in some juicy E3 gossip, IDOS Montreal head David Anfossi found himself in a spot of bother after he called out the Last of Us 2 demo for being a fake. During its E3 briefing, Sony unveiled a lengthy gameplay demo for The Last of Us Part 2, which showed off some very impressive animation and graphical prowess. Game developer Gregory Striftgeiser tweeted at Naughty Dog saying, quote, top of the animation game and action pacing. Anfossi then replied saying, and fake. And Fossey deleted the tweet pretty quickly, but not before a screenshot found its way to Naughty Dog animator Jonathan Cooper. Cooper replied to the accusation of it being fake, saying, quote, It's since deleted, but the studio head of Shadow of the Tomb Raider just accused the animation of our The Last of Us Part 2 demo of being fake. C'est trop délicieux. If you're wondering what c'est trop délicieux translates to like I am, it means it's too delicious in French. And Fossey has since apologised for the tweet saying, Hi Naughty Dog fans, please don't be tough on me, just bad wording from a French speaking person. Always been a big fan of Uncharted and Last of Us games, played all of them and Last of Us 2 is on my list. And what Naughty Dog does is a ref to me, sorry for this situation. Don't blame me, I'm French is uh, basically the excuse there. Uh, I'm just French, I'm, I'm not being a knob, I'm just French. Uh, <laughs> So that's that's what his defence is. I think it's good to have a kind of suspicious eye on these trailers. Not like completely, but just keep a bit of scepticism when you look at them because of the past and how how it's panned out in the past. Where yeah. you've had these awesome looking trailers, the games come out don't look quite as good. Yeah. So it's it's good to have a sceptical eye. But then like this is a senior developer who's just yeah. gone that's fake. Yeah, totally dismissing it out of hand. But if you look at the trailer itself, uh, you look at Ellie's face in this this scene where she's hiding behind like a counter and thing. You see the expression on her face. It doesn't look like that you could, you could achieve that in game. And that's probably what I was referring to there. Just to, just to, the facial expressions when you're just like going milling around the gameplay and doing some stealth thing. It's like Mike said, you probably should remain a little bit suspicious about it. But the fact that this, this guy calls it fake uh, means that obviously he couldn't achieve that in his game. It doesn't mean that Naughty Dog wouldn't be able to achieve that. And they, this is Naughty Dog talking about, they, they do special things. The jury is still out. What, what he's done here, um, saying it's fake. Uh, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Also this week, it turns out that much like the first Last of Us, The Last of Us Part 2 will have multiplayer. Speaking to GameSpot, co-director Anthony Newman said the faction's game mode would be making a return. Newman said, quote, multiplayer is coming back. We're not going to talk details yet about what format takes, but we can confirm there will be multiplayer. Before this interview, Sony and Naughty Dog had made no indication that multiplayer would be in The Last of Us Part 2. But given how popular it was in the first game, it makes sense that it's returning. And in other news, despite being announced at Bethesda's E3 conference, The Elder Scrolls 6 is still actually just in pre-production and is not yet playable. Elder Scrolls 6 was announced towards the end of Bethesda's conference as a surprise alongside the announcement of Starfield. In an interview with Jeff Keighley, Bethesda studio head Todd Howard explained why they announced The Elder Scrolls 6, even though it's a long way off. Howard said they announced Starfield and The Elder Scrolls 6 to, quote, get it all out there and let everybody know what we're doing. Howard also confirmed they had been working on Starfield for much longer and it will almost certainly launched before Elder Scrolls. Explaining the production a bit more, Howard said, quote, I would say Elder Scrolls 6 is in pre-production and Starfield is in production. It's a game we've been making for a while. Starfield is playable. Elder Scrolls 6, not in that way yet. So this, for some people, was the highlight of E3, um, the announcement that Elder Scrolls 6 is coming. The question mark is, they've not even started making the game yet, and you, you got to think that Elder Scrolls 6 has so much anticipation surrounding it because everyone loves that series. They've got to make sure that it's right, they've got to take the time doing it. The fact that they haven't even started doing it, you know, a normal kind of rotation for a game might be three years, four years, something like that. you got to consider that like it's three or four years out. It's not even, even be next gen. Could even be a next gen. Tomorrow. I mean, yeah, I mean, Starfield's coming before it and, and yeah. the two years into that production, which is great news because we, we want Starfield don't we? Yeah. we want to start for the first new IP from Bethesda in 25 years as they're pitching it. Everyone's excited about that. And um, Pete Hines in an interview said that it's crazy. It's just crazy what we're doing in that game. I'm super f***ing hyped. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the upshot is if, you, if you're thinking of oh, Fallout 76 is multiplayer, oh, the Elder Scrolls is a long way off. The plus side for me, I was quite, I was quite warm in the Bethesda conference. I, I, I enjoyed it. Like, I enjoyed what they had to, to give out, and, uh, and I liked the, the, the fact that they're so busy. I mean, they're a busy bunch at the moment. They've got yeah. a lot of stuff on the boil. As a publisher, as well as a developer, yeah. they've got a lot of other titles that they're not making, but they're, they're, they're publishing. So they've three full development teams now. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a busy bunch. So I am, um, yeah, I'm well looking forward to Elder Scrolls. I personally am just happy knowing that it exists 
it's and it is it is on the way. Other people feel differently, um, and, and that's that's fine. Whatever. But I I personally am excited that I know that it is a real thing that's happening. In other Bethesda news, Fallout 76 has been quite divisive with fans, and many aren't happy about the fact that it's an online game. On the Fallout subreddit, however, some fans and modders are planning to fix what they think is wrong with the game, even though it's not even out yet. Bethesda have already confirmed that private servers would be coming to Fallout 76 post-launch, and fans are planning on using the private servers to adjust the game to their liking. Fans are also volunteering themselves to roleplay as NPCs in the game world after Bethesda confirmed there would be no human NPCs in Fallout 76. Now that is dedication. Someone <laughs> just go like, fine, I'll be the one who runs the, the <laughs> tavern, the post-apocalyptic tavern. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty MMO-ish, actually. Yeah. That's, that's you see it in GTA 5. Yeah, online, sure, yeah, roleplay yeah. servers. People yeah. roleplaying all the time. Nice. I mean, it's great. It, I mean, people, this, this seems like people embracing the online thing more totally, than anything, yeah. isn't it? That's exactly what Bethesda would have wanted. This is exactly. exactly what they would want, people to really uh, commit to the online thing and, and have, build a community around a Fallout game, which you haven't been able to, to do in the past. And the, on the topic of mods as well, they've already said, um, Todd Howard also said that mods is, yeah, they love mods, Bethesda love mods. Committed to it. That is going to be a part of Fallout 76 as well, so no, no worries there. And finally in the news, Ubisoft revealed in their E3 conference they had partnered with a community collaboration platform, Hit Record, so that fans can submit their creative works, which could then be featured in Beyond Good and Evil 2 when that game comes out. The Space Monkey program, as it's called, allows fans to submit ideas into a series of categories like music and propaganda, where other fans can comment and remix those ideas, which will then be evaluated by Hit Record. If Hit Record think the idea is suitable for Beyond Good and Evil, they'll send it along to Ubisoft, and everyone who contributed to an accepted work will get paid. But the reaction to this program has been mixed, with some critics asking why are Ubisoft relying on fans to make art for the game when they employ their own in-house artists. One of the more notable critics is Night in the Woods co-developer Scott Benson, who criticised the hit record business model as being ethically muddy and for encouraging users to submit spec work, which are complete pieces of work that still might not get used. Another point of contention is hit record will have a $50,000 budget for the Space Monkey program, and it falls to them to decide who gets paid and how much. Critics argue Ubisoft is a multi-billion dollar company and they can afford to pay artists more than the allotted $50,000. Hit Record told Kotaku that artists can contest the payout plan and they have a two week period where artists can argue whether someone should be making more or less for the contribution. Ubisoft said they chose this approach because it will add to the diversity of their game and the multicultural feel is an important factor in Beyond Good and Evil 2. But critics responded to this saying if diversity is so important to Ubisoft then why don't they handpick artists from all over the world and pay them a fair wage instead of asking fans to do it. I'm a very cynical person, generally speaking, especially when it comes to video game stuff. I'm always like, uh, I'm always, you know, mentally calling stuff out, and I don't, I don't get hyped up for games very early on and stuff like that. I'm excited about this. I think this is cool. I think I, I like this idea. I like the fact that they're letting, you know, the community contribute in that kind of way, and then there's money going back. There's like a mental. Um, thing here where some people see it as like crowdsourcing and, and crowdsourcing art for their game and only having 50 grand to pay to cover the costs of it and then there's another perspective which is this is cool this is for fans who will kind of submit fan work and fan art anyway um, and they might just get a bit of money back for it and then for them it's, it'll be so cool to be in this game and fly past like a, a billboard or hear a song or something that they were involved in creating yeah. which is which is very cool for those people so there's two kind of schools of thought I'm very much in that camp that I just talked about there where it's, it's just cool for the fans. Just on another completely um, different level, it really excites me to think how big the world of Beyond Good and Evil is and how detailed. If they need this amount of workforce and this amount of um, people working on art and music to fill the game, it must yeah. be huge. Between this and Cyberpunk and Fallout 76 being four times bigger and stuff, games are, are growing yeah, in, a way, in, a, in a way this year. Ubisoft could absolutely fill this world if they just paid their artists, if they wanted to. They've made the choice to allow yeah. players and crea creative people, artists, and musicians or whatever to be a part of their world. They've, they've opened that door. The bottom line is you just don't have to submit anything. You, you're not exploited here. People say, no, this is ex exploitation. It's not. Giving someone an opportunity to be part of a world and a franchise that they might love. So just... just Calm down in it and just don't do it. Don't just, just if you're, it's yeah, outrage if you're, culture. For me, well, it's just people yeah. being outraged for the sake of being, oh, what? Ubisoft are doing that? Oh, let's, let's get outraged. 
Think, but think of this. Think of it. Think of, they probably have got artists. They've probably got loads of artists. And they, in, 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 Ubisoft is an international company with studios bloody everywhere. They've probably, well, they've definitely got artists working on art for this game. Yeah. And they've probably gone. Um, by the way, this game is is so huge that um, we just can't make enough art. And then the Ubisoft leadership, the management and stuff, have come up with this other yeah. way of, of doing it to add to what their artists are already doing. It's, yeah. it's always going to be a bit more of a complicated picture rather than extremes of Ubisoft doing nothing, yeah. expecting the community to do all of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. There's probably plenty of reasons why you can criticize exactly. Ubisoft, but this pro this isn't one of them. Yeah, but yeah, I do I, exactly. I agree with that. So there you have it. E3 2018 is in the history books. What caught your eye? What was what happened that was special and you will remember this year for? Let us know down in the comments below. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new around here. Check out more of our content on your screen there. You can support us on Patreon using that link right there. And we will see you again in the next video. Bye for now.